Have you ever wanted to get inside the mind of a billionaire? Today on the Entrepreneur Experiment podcast with me, Gary Fox, we do just that. This is a really special episode. It was recorded live a couple of weeks ago at the Dublin Tech Summit. We chat about a huge range of issues. Frank McCord is a business icon. He's a billionaire, he's a philanthropist, he's a sports team owner, technologist, real estate developer, the list is long. And we talk about a lot of subjects. But I start with the question that was burning in my mind. So keep an ear out for that. First, quick thank you to my sponsor, Sage, who are with me for the entire year of 2022. Sage are the number one provider of HR, payroll, and finance software to small and medium-sized enterprises all across the world, just like me and you. To find out more about Sage and how they can help your business, click the link in the bio below. Now, we're just about to get to my talk with Frank. But if you're based in Ireland, or even if you're not, and you'd like to come to a live event with me, at the end of season 10, I'm gonna do a live podcast in Dublin City. But the only way you can go is if you join my mailing list. Go to mrgaryfox.com to learn more. Now, let's get on my chat with Frank. Frank, good morning. Good morning to you. Welcome to Dublin, and welcome to the Dublin Tech Summit. It's great to be here, nice to be in Ireland. Absolutely, well, welcome home, essentially. So our audience will know you as a serial investor, entrepreneur across real estate, technology, sport, and civic enterprise. But I actually want to start with your mindset, and specifically your family mindset. Your family had a saying, which I adore, don't talk about problems unless you're willing to do something about them. Can you talk to me about how that shaped your mindset and your approach to life and business? Sure, yeah, as a, um, uh, well, I grew up in, in Boston, a big Irish Catholic family, one, one, uh, one of seven children. And um, yeah, I think me and my sibs were pretty good at identifying problems, you know, at the dinner table and moaning and groaning about things. And, uh, and mom or dad would always say, you know, before dinner was out, that's great. I think you've got the problem nailed, but now uh, what are you going to do about it? So when you, you know, kind of just uh, reflect on that for a moment, it's really a um, it's really true, isn't it? I mean, we can recycle on problems all day long and it's not particularly healthy, or we can actually um, step back and reflect on what's causing the problem and, and, and maybe do something about it. And I, I, I think we're certainly at that moment uh, right now in uh, you know, society at large when we see what the, you know, some of the large uh, issues that we're all facing. And I think really peeling the onion back and getting to the to root of the problem is a very, very important thing. I might add that, you know, um, my uh, great grandfather was uh, uh, you know, emigrated to the U.S. from uh, Northern Ireland, and uh, as a 13-year-old, and when he was 50, he started a, a construction company. He started building roads when Henry Ford started building cars in 1893, and um, so I mention that because the the combination of doing something about it and also the DNA of being builders, which is really core to, to my family problem solving, innovating, building, creating, and so forth. So, yeah, I think those two things uh, frame my outlook uh, often on, on uh, you know, looking at situations and, and trying to problem solve. Mm -hmm. I heard you speak previously about um, Web2. Uh, moving fast and break things has been the motto of Web2. Did we move too fast and break too many things? Yeah, I think, you know, move fast and, and break things is a ridiculous, you know, vision, it's just, it, it's pithy and cute, but it's really uh, um, not substantive in the sense that it's, it, it's really not uh, uh, purposeful per se. And, uh, and, and when you move fast and break things, and that's your mantra, you, you break things. And right now we're, we're uh, seeing what's happening with um, big things, you know, like democracies. And that's, uh, it's a scary, a scary thing. I noticed that somebody uh, titled this this talk as "Move Fast and Fix Things," which I think is is uh, really what's required right now. And and uh, but it's going to take you know a lot of work. And and you know one of the things in Web 2.0 that was missed, I think, because of the speed at which things uh, moved, was really having a you know thinking about what 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 were we, did we want to optimize for. Um, and when you what you optimize for with technology is, is what you get. You know, technology at the end of the day is, is simply a tool and um, uh, like a hammer, right? A hammer is a tool and you can use that uh, same hammer to walk outside and, and kill someone or you can use it to build a home. And 
and unfortunately, technology has been weaponized right now, and it needs to. I think we need to get a grip and make it the public utility that it should be, and a tool for 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 good. And uh, I think that's that's possible, but it's going to be a lot of work. You touched on something really important there. The internet and social media is incredibly powerful as a tool when used correctly. How do we now bring that into your vision of Web3 and Project Liberty? Bring the good, leave the bad. Well, uh, you know, Buckminster Fuller had a, a, a saying, and I'm going to paraphrase it. It was, you know, when, the, when a situation is flawed or broken, um, build a new model and make the old obsolete. And I think that's where we're at right now. I think we need to uh, declare the model, current model fundamentally flawed, and, uh, and we need a new model. I, uh, a lot of time and energy and effort is being spent on trying to um, tweak the current model, trying to constrain, uh, you know, create friction so that there's not further damage. I think uh, we'd be well served to really focus on a, a new model uh, that uh, can completely change the way the internet works. I think that's really fundamentally uh, important. We're at a moment here with the uh, skipping now, uh, just as we skipped from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0, we're now skipping to Web 3. It's happening. Uh, there's a lot of confusion around it, I know, because people, are, I think, are confused, confusing dodgy uh, cr uh, cryptocurrencies with blockchain, and they're, you know, blockchain enables certain things, but blockchain is not, uh, is much bigger and more powerful than some early use cases, which uh, um, are not uh, necessarily sound. I mean, we went through the same thing in 99, 2000, 2001 with 2.0. We had a, a dot com, so-called dot com boom and bust, and, uh, but that didn't mean that the internet and the World Wide Web wasn't evolving and, and, and becoming a, a uh, completely powerful and transformative piece of technology. So I think we're at the point now, luckily, where the technology is, is transitioning. And um, knowing now what the internet is capable of, very few knew that back 25 years ago, uh, but knowing it now, let's get it right. And let's reset how it works. And uh, I think that's, uh, you know, we're at a moment where that, where that is possible. And I, the way I look at it, it's, you know, it's let's give everyone a mulligan for not knowing what was going to end up happening, uh, but no second mulligans. You know, now we have an opportunity to fix it and, and let's do so. You touched on an interesting word there, reset. After the last couple of years in the world, it feels like we are at a point of reset in, in many ways. Do you think Web3 can be our reset? In part. Uh, I think there's nothing inherent about Web3 that is going to solve the problem. You know, it actually could make things worse, right? I mean, it's just technology. Yes. So I think that, um, you know, we need to be, uh, you know, more holistic in our thinking. And this idea that the technology is going to solve the problems inherent in the, you know, new technology is going to solve the problems inherent in current technology, I think is repeating the mistake. We have to solve the problem. You know, so it's, it, the, we have societal issues right now. We have is, real issues with democracies and real questions about whether they're sustainable, including in, you know, in, in, in America. Uh, and uh, so we have this moment where there's new technology, which creates new promise, but we need not repeat the mistakes of, of 2.0, meaning skip the, stake, the, the uh, a step regarding governance, for instance. So with Project Liberty, it's a, I think what differentiates it uh, are two things. Uh, n number one, it's not a unit track uh, or simply a tech project. I, I don't even view it as a tech project. It's, it's really a three track solution to a societal problem, right? So there's a movement track, a governance track, and a tech track. Uh, the tech is important, but it's not the, the be all and the end all. The governance track may be the most important of, uh, of all. And then the second differentiator is the fact that we are coming forward with a solution. And that's a, um, what we call DSNP, which is a decentralized social networking protocol. And uh, you know, back in 2019, uh, when we were studying the issue, really the aha moment for me when talking to our head of our labs group was uh, this idea of rethinking how the social graph works. So rather than you, know, you and I and everyone having individual graphs, and there are billions of atomized graphs which get vacuumed up by a few large entities, 
what if the, the social graph was decentralized, universal, and all of our data went into a public portion of the internet. So think of the data that we create as being actually fundamentally part of the internet, but a public part of the internet. And then we get to build on top of that private use cases using the data. But rather than clicking on these absurd cookies where we agree to terms that we don't read of these large uh, uh, applications, what if that was reversed? And the apps that were built, uh, you, you and I had agency, in other words, of, with our data within this large reservoir, and the apps that were built agreed to our terms. Mm -hmm. So we set the terms for our data, who uses it, for what purpose, on what terms. So um, a decentralized universal social graph would do that. One large body of data growing every minute of every day um, and uh, with individuals having agency within that and owning and controlling their data. The internet is not the problem. Big data is not the problem. Big data can actually help us solve problems at scale. It's how it's all being used that's the fundamental problem. And the internet sim operates in a certain way based on protocols that we've all agreed to use, right? And it can operate differently if we agree on another protocol or protocols and it would operate differently. So I think the social graph is key. DSMP is not tokenized. It's deliberately not uh, a piece of blockchain. It's a core internet protocol. We released it one year ago. It's open source, so now it's, it's yours, yours, everyone's, and people now are building on it. So the question is, will it be adopted at scale? And if it is, the internet would be transformed. That, in conjunction with Web3, could and in conjunction with governance, right? With people actually, social scientists and computer scientists getting together and talking about uh, answering the questions, what is the purpose of this technology? What, who is it for? How should it be used? And then the technologies build within a framework as opposed to just moving fast and breaking things. Mm. We walked past the headquarters of the large social giants last night. <laughs> I don't think they're going to let this just come on in. How do we combat that? How do people take charge of their own data? Well, I think that's the, you know, the third track of, of Project Liberty is a movement track. We, we need to, uh, we as citizens of democracies, need to take charge of our future. And, uh, and so uh, we need to uh, first understand what's at stake. Uh, Second, understand what's possible. And then three, do something about it. And so uh, we, we, we really need to, uh, I think, uh, prioritize this issue. Uh, it, it, because it is, things like democracy and capitalism, you know, these operating systems we have as, as uh, you know, democratic societies, are built on one simple concept. It's called trust. And, uh, and we have benefited for several hundred years now with a uh, societal trust, you know, where institutions work for the citizenry in order to support our democracies. That trust is being eroded, and it's being eroded very, very fast. You know, in, in, um, in the U.S., uh, my family started a, endowed a public policy school in Washington, D.C., at Georgetown University. In, and we founded that school in October of 2013. Uh, it was not lost on anyone that during the opening ceremonies, our government was shut down. And so we had to move all of those ceremonies on, you know, to tents on the campus and so forth from federal buildings where, they had, where it had been scheduled because they were padlocked. Um, in seven short years, we went from a, a government shutdown dysfunction you know, kind of an early indicator of, of, of what was happening to full-on insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Seven years. That's really rapid deterioration. And it's, it's continuing as we sit here. So I think it's really time that we, we really step back from this and, and think about problem solving at the, at the Uber level. You know, I was asked to, I had the privilege of speaking to the Reporters Without Borders. Uh, uh, they had a... Um, uh, conference uh, like this on mis- and disinformation and its impact on democracy. 
uh, and I, it was uh, last September during UN General Assembly week. And it was, uh, it was just, uh, uh, you know, I'll never forget it. I mean, the, the first speaker was uh, Maria Ressa, who subsequently won the Nobel Prize. And she referred to the, the impact that uh, mis and disinformation is having on, on uh, our democracies as an atomic bomb. And we need to treat the damage being done with that level of urgency. Now, she was the first speaker. I think she and I were the only civilians. You know, other, others were heads of states and ministers, were people who were appointed or elected to protect democracy. I was the 12th speaker. So there were 10 intervening speakers. And each one, uh, each one talked with such urgency and such concern, it was almost a plea for help. They were doing everything in their power to keep their democracies going. The imagery that I had uh, while they were all speaking was of this massive, massive fire burning. And <clears throat> Gary, you and I are sitting here with little garden hoses with low water pressure, you know, trying to put out the fire while thousands of people have five, you know, five liter cans of gasoline and they're pouring them on the fire. It's, it, we need to, to I, I believe, change our thinking and step away from mitigation only. How can we control the damage, do triage, tame the fire a bit to saying, no, the internet is fundamentally flawed the way it's operating. The idea that people can extract our data and exploit it, um, monetize it, use it in permissionless ways, and even weaponize it is, is not, is not a, it's, democracies are not sustainable with that architecture because the, the trust as it gets eroded and at, at some point disappears, the democracy disappears as well. I would say capitalism disappears because it's also built on a concept, the concept of, of trust. And I don't see the, the, the logical reason why either of those operating systems would continue if the trust is completely destroyed. So I think we're at a, a really important moment. And um, now, what I don't want is to come across as, you know, the sky is falling guy, because it, this is back to my dinner table now. And we can do something about this. I'm hugely optimistic about the ability to, to problem solve here and to fix this. But it's, it's not gonna necessarily make the incumbents happy, but I think that's irrelevant. You know, the fact of the matter is it's our democracy, and so we need to, we need to preserve it and protect it and strengthen it and, uh, here and uh, in the U.S. And so our project is, you know, transatlantic. Uh, the institute, which is focused on governments, just, just opened in Paris at Sciences Po and uh, a branch in D.C. with Georgetown. But that's just the beginning. You know, we want to be here. We want to be everywhere. The point is this is not my project or one family's project. This needs to be our our project, it's our democracy. And I think we need to shift our thinking away from just you know, tech being the be all end all to putting tech in its proper perspective. It's a tool, powerful for sure, can help us solve problems at scale for sure, but we need to use it with purpose. And, uh, and, and we need to decide what those purposes are. And that's why the governance track I think is equally important. When me and you were sitting here in five, 10 years time, what will success look like for you for Project Liberty? Uh, we don't have five or 10 years, in my opinion. So uh, we need a man on the moon type of approach to this. Uh, and I said to, to everyone working on this, look, we need within three years to have a, a, a wholly new e ecosystem, a decentralized social networking ecosystem where um, the totally functioning, where the uh, old model becomes obsolete. You know, I was just in, in, uh, in Davos a few weeks ago and we announced a partnership with Polkadot and Web3 Foundation. They are on board now with Project Liberty. We've chosen Polkadot as our layer zero chain. And, uh, and Gavin Wood, who some of you may know, who started Ethereum and now has another project called Polkadot, um, has come out to endorse DSNP as the way forward for decentralized social networking. So I think we need to build the new ecosystem and let thousands of, of developers build on it. Really important to, to, to highlight, we're not talking about you know, building another Goliath to topple an existing Goliath. We're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of Davids that can replace the Goliaths. 
And that's, that's what uh, Web3 would allow, and that's what decentralization allows. So I think Web3 is coming just in the nick of time for democracies, but again, there's nothing inherent in blockchain that's gonna solve the problem. We need to solve the problem and make sure blockchain works for people and for humanity. It's a beautiful image, thousands of Davids. Starting your career and looking at this project from the outside, you seem to have this ability to spot talent and bring people together on a journey. How do you do that? Mm, that's a good question. I, uh, I, I think it's, um, well, it's partly experience for sure. And, uh, you know, when you live a, a full life, and I've lived a privileged uh, life, it's, um, you, you do a lot of interesting things along the way, including make a lot of mistakes and have failures. And each step of the way, you, you learn a bit about what really matters. And I think at the end of the day, for me, what is most important is, is really in, a, in an enterprise, it's, it's cult, I'd call it culture. It's what are the values that you really embrace as a, as a family or as, as an enterprise? And are you willing to really uh, stick with those during the tough times? And likewise, with individuals who comprise that culture, right? They are the carriers of the culture. It's, it's really uh, you know, people with character and that aren't, um, uh, that really treat others well, you know, like they want to be treated in, 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 in a respectful way, have learned the art of listening, and, um, you know, really are team players and collaborative in nature, and uh, really will make the right decision at the difficult moments. You know, the mantra in our enterprise is uh, long view, high road, long view, and it's uh, something that was passed to me uh, and I was, uh, I'm sure it was passed up, you know, to my, uh, to my folks by, by theirs. And this idea of, you know, let's, let's look at the, the, the long-term horizon here and not the immediate, uh, and also make those hard decisions. And, uh, you know, when, the, when confronted with it, what's the, we all know what the right choice is, mm. usually, right? And, 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 um, and unfortunately, we can't always do that, right? Because there's always pressures, right, and uh, well, we, we, we need to put food on the table or, or uh, make payroll or this or that, and, and uh, we're, f for me, when I say I've, I've lived a privileged life, I don't, I have no excuse not to make the right decisions at this stage of my life, and uh, in, in a lot of those other issues that I, I fully empathize with, and I've been there, uh, it, it, we, we don't have that excuse, you know? So it's trying to, to, to really model good behavior and uh, you know, attract people that really want to do the right thing. I, I've learned that the world is full of problem solvers. The world is full of really, really decent, wonderful people. And it's a shame, really, that right now so much of the narrative is the opposite, right? So much of the narrative is, is uh, we seem to be recycling around the negative, around the problem. And I think we need to move. One of the most important things I think we can do is, is to shift that energy and shift that dialogue to solutions. You know, the man on the moon. I think we really need to shift the dialogue to a place where we have a project, we have hope, and that hope to, you know, displaces the kind of the negativity or the despondency, which takes on a life of its own, unfortunately. And uh, I'm a huge believer in people, and, I, and I'm, I'm really confident, which is why I say I'm a huge optimist, even though we have a big problem. So I think being an optimist can't just disguise, you can't just say, oh, everything's gonna be fine, and not identify and be realistic about the problems. But we can solve them, and we have a tremendous, tremendous, uh, capacity, creative capacity uh, in, our, in our humanity. And I, I don't, I, we just can't sit and let this happen. I think we need to all intervene and, and really uh, fix things and move on. And I think if we can fix social media, which is what we're started, starting with, because it's, it's the gasoline on the fire. If we can fix that, I think we can fix many, many other problems. And there are big ones out there to be fixed and addressed. But uh, I think we have to start with with uh, in, uh, where the triage and the problem solving will be most effective. I think most entrepreneurs are realistic optimists. I think they, they, they have 50-50. We have a minute and a half left. I'd like you to speak a little bit on Project Liberty and getting people involved. If people are watching online or people are sitting in the audience here, 
What do you want people to do? You talk about building an army of Davids. What do you want people to do right now? This goes right back to the start of our conversation. Let's not just talk about the problem, let's actually go try to solve it. So what do you want people to do? Well, as I said, I think there's, there are millions and millions of problem solvers out there and people that would like to see this, this problem addressed and fixed, and I would, uh, I would welcome everyone to make it their project. This, the key of success for Project Liberty is that the project is embraced by many. And, uh, and by the way, if there is a better project than, than this one, a better idea, let's all support that one. I was actually very um, alarmed when I said to our tech team, go find out who's focused on the social graph and is, is tackling this problem and let's go support them. When uh, uh, we didn't find anyone doing it, it was a bit shocking to me. And that's when we launched uh, this project. The name comes from uh, the moment we launched it. We were on Statue of Liberty Island in uh, New York Harbor at a, a company um, function. And uh, the next day, Braxton Woodham, who runs our labs, when he was assembling the team, said, you know, he wrote the email and said, RE, Project Liberty. So it's kind of, kind of stuck. But the answer to your question is, it, it's just, we, it, it's a big invitation. Get involved if you'd like. And go to projectliberty.io, take a look at it, be in touch, and make it your project. And that's the key. I mean, DSMP is open source. Project Liberty is, is, is open source. This is an impact project designed to uh, you know, address a big problem that we have right now in our society. And, it's not a tech project. It's a project to, to save democracy. Thank you so much. Frank, it's been a privilege. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. Thank you for sharing your lessons and your goals. Frank McCourt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Thanks. Thank you.